friends, and welcome to episode 89 and feeling fine of the No Clip podcast. Myself, the Irish guy, Jeremy, the Boston guy. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm a guy over here. That's I'm podcasting here. Yeah, Wait, that's that? new. I'm not good at the Boston accent. I that's yeah. I when I was younger, I was glad I didn't have it, and now I'm very sad that I don't have it. Yeah, it's like my Irish people are like, "Oh, you're from Ireland," and it's because I was like, I've been talking American and ordering my Starbucks for Danny <laughs> and all that shit. Um, and then we got Frank, Frank yeah. the Polish sausage. Well, my dad is Irish and from Boston, so it's like I have that down pat. It's I oh, mean, I mean well, now I to, yeah. My immediate thought, all you have to say to sound from Boston, you just have to say wicked. Oh, that's yeah. wicked awesome. That's wicked, wicked awesome. I used to say wicked all the time, and then I got made fun of in college, and the shame oh. just shamed it was out Was it because the musical was big? I remember in high school, every girl walked around with the wicked book. Yeah, it wasn't cool we were walking out of the musical. We were like, "Yo, that was wicked good, dude." <laughs> oh. <laughs> yo, which witch do you like? Yeah? Yo, I like the like, evil one. You like the nice one or the or the wicked one? <laughs> yo, she was wicked cool, dude. Yo. Uh, we're gonna talk about some wicked cool video games. Return to Monkey Island, Hyper Demon, Trombone Champ, a late entry, <laughs> um, and Road Warden, to mention uh, just a few. But uh, I want to first of all shout out all of our amazing Battle Pass holders: Cody Krieger, Forrest Pruitt, Andy Fagan, Cameron Ladd, George Sakotis. Jacob Godserve, and Toe here, Tiliev. Thank you all so much. And thank you to all of our patrons. If you'd like to support this 100% ad-free podcast, fund our documentaries, and get access to a bunch of bonuses, including videos, bonus podcast episodes, Discord, head over to patreon.com slash noclip. I am, um, my hands, I'm not sure, this is, this will be a video podcast very soon. And it's because of what I'm about to say. My hands, you can't see them because it is not yet a video po- podcast, but the guys can. It can't really. It doesn't really come across just how gnarled up they are because of all the furniture that I have been building at the NoClip uh, studio. Yeah, how it's are been, things going over there? It's going good. We have, so I have built how many? One, two, three, four, five bookshelves slash shelf situations, three storage racks, one of those, I got another one of those big Ikea Calyxes. You know the one? Dude. You just, I got it white this time, though. because <laughs> We had the black one for like six years. So I'm like, okay, we got, we got one of those. It's full of tat. Um, I got a couch. I built a couch. It's a really shit couch. Uh, it does the job. Um, the internet came in yesterday. The download's good. The upload's terrible. I'm trying to get them to fix the upload because right now it's like 40 up. And I, I, the max I can get without having to spend thousands on a fiber installation is 200 up. So I'm like, this needs to be closer. I can't, 40 is not going to cut it. We need to be able to upload stuff in GTFO. Um, but yeah, it's good. We're going to, I'm going to have, uh, you're going to come down later this week and we'll record a little uh, sort of tour of the place. Um, it's quite yellow at the moment, I'll say, because the walls <laughs> are and the lights are, but I'm working on all that. We'll color grade um, that out. Exactly. Yeah, we'll just put a fat. We'll have a fat no clip lush for anything we shoot at the studio. Um, Subtract yeah, sixty should... percent yellow. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, it'll it, it it's gonna be cool. We're gonna have a, a basically a podcast slash streaming room that's gonna be there. I have a whole area set up for um, recording uh, the B roll. Remember uh, a B roll place for Jeremy to like film. You know beautiful boxes while they're surrounded by other things um we have an area for an interview filming which i'm setting up like this pull downs where you can pull down green screens and pull down white or pull down black screens behind people and um, we will probably be using that for a documentary uh, in a couple of weeks or at least next month um which is pretty exciting i can't talk about it quite yet uh but yeah it's uh it's coming along a lot of unpacking um the 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 big storage place that we had booked out is almost empty. It's got some camping gear in it, which I guess I'll have to stick in the studio while I'm in between houses. But uh, yeah, it's a good time. I'm excited. I'm excited for you to come down and check it out as well, Jeremy. Yeah, I'm excited too. I'm just now realizing that we missed out on a huge opportunity to film, like put a camera on the ceiling and have you, as you're unpacking all the things, like you're finding keepsakes from your former life, like the old studio and the unpacking music <laughs> is playing in the background. Oh my god, yeah. You mean the unpacking the video game? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, you're right, yeah. Have like a little f- sort of, uh, what do they call that again? That that angle? The uh, uh, Isometric. No, no, oh. remember? No, the, the projection. Oh. Ortho- orthographic. Yeah, orthographic projection, projection is what they use for isometric games. You're right, that's yeah. what it it's is. It's like Celsius yeah, yeah. and centigrade. 
Exactly. It's the, it's oh the my Celsius God, and centigrade of, it. <laughs> of projections. Uh, Frank, we're going to get you down as well because yes. uh, we have recently found out that your local airport flies into our local airport. It's very cute. I'm happy. It's pretty good. Yeah, they use tiny yeah. little airplanes. It's adorable. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, you will find it. I haven't been on one of those planes where you like have to walk to the runway and get in, like a, t- in a t- sixteen seat airplane. But oh yeah, well, Long Beach has a lot of those. But it'll be exi- It'll be exciting. I I hate to disappoint you. I think it actually might be a regularly large Alaskan <laughs> airline flight. Oh, perfect. Um, I think it has like forty seats on it, so it's Ooh. not. It's not quite. Yeah, I used to take a prop jet home from London sometimes to my local airport, Waterford back when it was an open airport and I would fly over my house and my mom would see me come in and then drive to the airport. It was like some fucking, I don't know, Australian <laughs> musical bullshit or something. I, I wish it was a, uh, I, a friend of mine uh, mentioned the B-12, the stealth bomber to me recently. And oh on a gosh. whim, I decided to look up the Wikipedia for it. And Igor Benson, who invented the B-12 uh, bomber, I don't, I don't know if it's a bomber, the mm. B-12 airplane also uh, was a, an innovator of rotor kites and uh, I think gyro gliders, which are one man helicopters, like the little, like a motorized version of the little Da Vinci helicopter. Oh my God. Um, so I, Frank, I think, I think we should invest in a no clip gyro <laughs> glider to get you Amazing. up here faster. Um, I, I watch YouTube videos of people in gliders and uh, and in gyrocopters, like fan things, and it's just nuts. Because it's like if a plane's engine goes out, you can you know you can glide up. If you have enough height, you can. It's like you can trade you know altitude for airspeed until the cows come home, and you'll you'll find somewhere to land. If you're thirty five thousand feet, even a passenger jet boat air boat of them go. It's like Sully was only a problem because he was only like a thousand feet off the ground. <laughs> Whereas if you're in like if you're in a glider or one of these things, like, if the, I guess a glider's fine, maybe. But, like, if you're in, like, one of these little rotary, pro, you know, like, fan fucking things, and that goes, like, you're just going to fall like a lead balloon. Like, that's, yeah. that's terrifying. Yeah, I have no interest in, in doing that. It's well, like it's like going to space, where it's like, I've one thing goes wrong, and you're just fucked. It's like, man was not meant to explore these frontiers, all right? I was going to say, I feel like now having played so many battle royales over the last few years, I feel like I'm fairly <laughs> confident in dropping out of planes and finding a place to land. So like, you know, like, I don't know. They they always drop you at the airport, but the loot there is way overpriced. You have to Uber out. <laughs> Fuck that. Just drop immediately into like a Costco or something. So Wait, or a Best Buy. Yeah. Did you, I, I got way into aviation YouTube, so maybe this didn't come across <laughs> you guys. But there was a YouTuber who was like in aviation YouTube who like pretended his plane broke and crashed it and jumped out of the plane with a parachute on. And like the whole thing was a setup. And Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. And he like, cr- his plane crashed. And he was like, like, I watched it and it was kind of like, I think this is set up. Like it's, and then the people who are actual like pilots were like, oh, like he does a million things here to make no sense unless you were going to pl- crash your plane, why you would do this. Is- and he's, he's like banned from the FAA. You can watch him. You can watch the, his video still online. Like I was going to say, is there a documentary about this? Cause I want to, I want to, that's a great story. That's yeah, amazing. Let's interview that guy. That's Wild. like that's like the new DB Cooper, the guy who faked a. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It's DB Cooper, but he's got no treasure. It's yeah. DB Cooper, but instead of doing it, and nobody know who he, it's like the inverse. Yeah, because it's like he had like five cameras trained on him the entire time. Yeah, he did it specifically go, for the clout. Yeah, that exactly, was the, the yeah. clout was the treasure. Yes, exactly. The, exactly. He didn't have any treasure. Yeah, he they say his clout is, is buried in a chest somewhere in the Mojave. <laughs> Dude, do you remember the story Ty Root used to tell us about his job as a news guy? Uh, vaguely. Uh, I remember some helicopter stories from Ty. Yeah, it was so wild. He used to, he was our, was our old boss at GameSpot, um, Ty Root, and he, uh, he worked at IGN for years as well. Uh, Texas dude. Um, looks like a jet pilot, just like, like just a handsome gentleman and a, and a nice guy. And he had a, uh, he had a job working at a, yeah, like a local news helicopter thing. And they'd like take off from the local army base and all this sort of stuff. And he said, yeah, like it was scary because they were so low that if the props went, because you can also glide a helicopter down, but you just need enough altitude to get it into the the turn so you can sort of not like pancake. But he said they were so low that like if anything happened, they were dead. And then it's just like, ah, ah. I don't know how you go to work in the morning knowing that you're, you might fall out of the sky and die. It's wild. It's, it's wild. People are people are brave out there. Not us. Not video us. Video editors. Cowards. <laughs> exactly. Uh, let's talk about some cowardly video games. I've been chatting too much already, so we can we'll hold the Monkey Island stuff for a second. Let's talk about something that more of us have been playing. 
Uh, dealer's choice, Frank. Pick from the two you have, because a bunch that we can yeah. all kind of talk about some of them. Well, I feel like. Well, I mean, I feel like the the fun weird. Well, there's two fun weird new games on Steam, <laughs> but uh, I feel like hyper hyper De- demon is uh is one that's like definitely worth talking about and playing and getting hands on experience. Um, hyper demon. So yeah, hyper demon is the follow up to Devil Daggers. Uh, I, I'm not even like too familiar with that developer. I don't know if it's one person making it. Um, but uh, it's. Jeez, I don't know even when this came out. Just a few days ago, and, yeah, uh, it like shadow dropped, like yeah. out of nowhere. Because Devil Tigers came out in like 2016. It's like a first person, like sort of Quake aesthetic, or like kind of yeah, I don't know, Quake like hook mo- Like it's it's very fast, crazy wide field of vision, and like just like arena. You're just shooting in like a void, basically. Was Devil Tigers, uh, Hyper Demon, similar? Yeah, I feel like if, if it's if it's like a leap in, in generation or even graphics, is Devil Daggers feels very much like early Quake, yeah, early early Doom, whereas Hyper Demon almost has like a Dreamcast res aesthetic where mm. everything is like goopy and, and, and just like ov- visually overwhelming. Or I feel like Devil Dagger was very like hell demons. Hyper Demon is like what I imagine what like panicked parents of the 90s thought what Mortal Kombat was. <laughs> it's like that is the emotion you play Hyper Demon. It's 6,000 screaming skulls coming at you, melting at you, exploding. It, like it is it is so like it's like 10 times what Devil Daggers is and uh it's, yeah. Yeah, Chris over at a Highlight Reel descri- described it as Quake Salvia. That's amazing. And I and it is it is the perfect like you just need to watch a trailer of this. It is like a it's like somebody like got an AI get, got an AI to make like it made an AI play Quake for like a million hours and listen to a lot of Tool, and and said go make a game and it this is like or watch a lot of Tool videos maybe is maybe a fair way to say because it is just so intensely weird it's it's like and also the controls and what you do it's not like a normal first person shooter like they have a training mode that has like very specific ways of controlling this game where you have to like you're shooting out of your like outstretched hand first of all and you're kind of shooting like i don't even know what they are like fucking swords sometimes it's very confusing and you have to like to jump you you look down and shoot your hand down and then you can like do a butt stomp by right clicking and then you like there are jewels you can smash and then you right click to like you know pick up the the shards but then that turns into a like a fucking proton (laughs) laser that then when you uh, release the right click it shoots that and like the combination of all these things like i've i've played a bit of it and it like it's very leaderboard heavy i haven't looked up any videos of people who are actually good at this thing frank how good have you gotten so i when i just finished a run like 30 minutes ago i think 3100 so like i think my time is like 17 seconds but the way they calculate time isn't literally how long you're in the thing it's almost like a score so the better you're doing your time will go up so i actually my i noticed how high my time was and i let myself die because like this hey you know what my score is not gonna get better because i'll end up the game gets so overwhelming. I'll start turtling. I'll go to like the edge of the map and shoot. And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, my time's in the negatives. You're not supposed to play. You're supposed to play aggressive. So you can look. Every replay is saved. Every high score. So I went to the very top. And oh, the top wow. the top leaderboard, like, it's, it's I don't even know how to equip. It's like it's like seeing master level Tetris where it's, they're able to read everything. They're dodging. But the, the, the game changer is when enemies like flash you can go up and almost do like a finisher on it you like dash into it and kill it so this person i watched at first was like was in front of every single enemy constantly like shooting dodge shooting dodge like constant movement it's like how the how the hell is it even possible like i can't read that fast because the even, dodge yeah. window is like short yes. isn't it like yeah. you have to wait for their eyes to glow and if and if they hit you you're dead <laughs> so so it's like it's, yeah it's like super high stakes it's um it, it's nuts and one of my favorite elements of the game is whenever you get the power up which again you're supposed to jump into or like our our you know rocket jump to get into then when you get the power up your field of vision which is already like cranked out goes like 180 <laughs> degrees or even more and it's like it's like watching a conor o'malley video you're just completely like what you're completely <laughs> overwhelmed by it so then it just gets like it's you have to learn how to read it you have to learn the enemies but it's crazy because i'll start getting panicking and i'll start screaming and squirming in my chair like oh my god and then that's when i die because the skulls surround me but yeah i i love this game i love the look of it um I, and i also like these very much like I, I consider them like xbox live like 360 or xbox arcade these very like quick pickup arcade games these speedrunner games i would love to see like 
if the next thing Star Wrath makes is like a campaign, if it was possible to make a like multi like a single player campaign with this kind of crazy stuff, it rules. But I like that it's so pick up and play. You can recommend it, and people can immediately uh, check it out. I think it's yeah, fifteen bucks on Steam. But oh my god, it's such a such a nice surprise. Yeah, it's kind of like it's like a thumper is another game that like thematic or like visually, I guess, and and also kind of in the way it plays, the freneticism of it is. Is similar, uh, Jeremy. Have you have you seen screenshots of this? Or I, I of this watched thing? some footage of it. I haven't played it myself yet um, because I was busy playing other things. But it looks it looks right at my alley. Also, when I saw you type in Quake Salvia, I was thinking that there needs to be more like uh, video game drug hybrids. You know, yes. like what if Metal Gear Acid was actually Metal Gear <laughs> on acid? Right, Hotline Miami is kind of Grand Theft Auto Two cocaine. Yeah, you know what I mean, it's absolutely, like, or, or GTA cocaine or something like that. This is like, yeah, it's it's such a it's such a deeply weird game. Like, I just love how... E- even the menu. It's just, it's just like, what are, you, what are you doing? Like, it's just the, the name of the game stretched out to fit the screen with, like, the selections in the middle. I just love the energy that this developer, Sorath, comes with. It's just so very strange. Um, yeah, go pick up Hyper Demon, all caps, <laughs> on Steam. <laughs> Fourteen ninety nine. Uh, get it. To drink a single drop of Immortal's blood is to die a thousand times over. That's the text that comes up. That's what I'm start, always saying, so. dude. Did they get that for yeah, me? Exactly. That's how you. That's how he does his mic check before every <laughs> podcast. That's what we ask um, subjects when we interview them. Uh, it used to be, "What do you have for breakfast?" And now we ask, "How many drops of, of God's oh, blood yeah. do you need to drink?" Uh, let's go to the other end of the deeply weird spectrum, but another game that sort of just kind of appeared on Steam, although it didn't really this week. It seems like it's only blown up in the past 24 hours because of a, uh, a PC Gamer tweet, which has gotten like 15,000 retweets or something. Um, uh, it came out on the September 15th, which was uh, about a week and a day ago by the time this goes up. Um, Trombone Champ. <laughs> this is just... <laughs> There's an old um, English comedian. I forget. Is it Clive, Clive something? Clive Anderson? No, not Clive Anderson. Clive somebody. English comedian. And he had this bit where he would play a piano um, like wrong. Where, but, but to do it, you have to be very skilled because you have to be able to play the piano and then also know the funny note and when to play it. So he used to do like, you know, he'd play it fine and then do a bum note every now and again. And it was... It's, there's something so like immediately funny about that, which I don't know. You just it, it, the note is the punchline. It's just it's just funny, and that's what just what this game is. <laughs> um, Frank, explain to you the best you can yeah. what Trombone Champ is. So so Trombone Champ is like I would call it like a parody rhythm game, uh, but it's completely in character and sincere when you're playing it. Uh, it, it kind of looks like Wii music, like it has very like Nintendo dra- graphics. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a trombone rhythm game where the way you play it is you ha- you, you're playing a trombone, but it's by scrolling your mouse up and down as the slide, and then you're clicking on the beat. The thing that's impressive, when you look up the game on Steam, it's like, oh, this looks like a joke. But when you're playing it, it's like, oh, this actually, the UI is great. It's like... They went above and beyond what you'd expect from like a normal like shit post of a Steam game. It's like, oh no, this is actually real. And what makes it so funny is it's like, as Danny was saying, was like, oh, they're hitting all the, they're they're riffing on like popular songs. They're all royalty free songs, like Auld Lang Syne, Hava Nagila, uh, uh, um, Take uh, Me Out to the Ball Game. Yeah, just the, the Entertainer, like just every song you know. But then they're remixed with like trap air horns and trap sounds. Like when you do well, it's air air air, and then like. <laughs> And it's like you're you're a lot because yeah the, it's so fun because it's like more normally in rhythm games you play well because that's the fun of it but playing trombone champ it's like no what if I just scroll my mouse up and down because it really doesn't matter what score you get like it's just the fun of playing it and uh, it's it's really funny and the video graph like like if you ever play like DDR or Ultramax or whatever these newer games are in arcades they have really fancy funny like videos the backing visuals on all of these like <laughs> so are good. so funny there's one about the american anthem and it ends in like cheeseburgers and like i feel like shopping malls or something like very like jokey 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 uh you can collect cards like it's like it, the other thing too it's really hard for a game to be funny or at least funny to me like yeah. yes stanley parable passes the mark i'm sure monkey island i've heard is really brilliant i'm excited to get into it but a uh, trombone champ was genuinely making me laugh i was like oh this is legitimately funny like i don't know it, 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 it impressed me 
It's yeah. like if you heard your neighbor do "Take Me Out to the Ball Game" and it was like, <laughs> <laughs> like, like, the, like you're you're playing the game because like if you don't if you don't nail like where it is if you're slightly high or slightly low like like it it's just always hilarious because you're so close. It's not like you're hitting the wrong note. You're you're like almost there, and it's like, yeah. So it's it's always it's just such a funny. I was laughing playing. You know what I mean? And then your hand starts to jiggle. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, I, I hurt. I, I, I heard it also I works. Say, it's yeah. it's funny that like um usually rhythm games there's no kind of in between. You either like hit the beat or you fail. And so it's 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 also like that what that allows for is when people are playing music like in real life. If you're if you're botching that many notes, I feel like you kind of like stop and maybe like take a breather and start from the top or something. But the music just keeps plowing through, and so it's just like the the worst most committed rendition of every song. Yes, it's so fucking I don't, funny. I, I don't watched think a bunch of fail stage. Oh, really? there, yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't think know. So, no. it, yeah, you can't. So you're right. It just keeps going. You're right because if you, if you, if, yeah, if you miss enough like guitar, you know, hits or whatever, or drum hits in those games, Rock Band or Guitar Hero, <laughs> the, the, the the crowd boos. Whereas yeah, in this, yeah. it's just you're playing for yourself. Or in just real remind, life, you just give up. It, it, right. remi- it reminds me of like the early days of YouTube. I would look up like talent show video, like Weezer talent show, and you would find like the same thing of just like kids committed and oh, it doesn't sound great, but it's this is amazing. But yeah, it's the same energy of just like. This this sounds off, but it's so funny. And it has that. It has the aesthetic of like sort of like bowling uh, bowling alley television. You know what I mean? Where it has like in the, like for the one, two, three strikes, you're at. You, there's like a ball. Like you hear the baseball hit, and the ball comes towards you. And then like the words that come up are so strange. It's like perfect or meh or nasty. Nasty, <laughs> nasty just keeps coming up. It was like what. Nasty was nasty right. good or bad? I couldn't tell from the videos. I, I, I could not tell either. It, yeah, it kind of feels like it. I didn't know about the cards. Mm-hmm. You like unlock cards for famous jazz players. Yeah, and like, and like and the and the cards are well written. Like it, there's a running gag with every single one. They're, they're, you're pulling up famous musicians. The game's composer comes up. Was like, oh, this is the best. <laughs> this is the greatest music in the world. Like, he's still out there today making music. Like, and like there's it's just really fu- yeah, it's funny and the way. The way you like, uh, you can disembowel cards and cr- literally crap out a new card. So I, en- I encourage you to try it out. Try wow. the card system. Um, but yeah, that, and again, like the game is very funny and jokey, where it's just like, we'll get, let's just riff on other mechanics of video games. So the fact that it has cards <laughs> in loot, like, oh, you can collect all the, uh, you know, Mozart cards. Like, it's just, it's funny. And uh, yeah, it, I, and like, it seems like you can unlock other instruments. So it's like, I'm, I'm excited yeah. to see what the collectibles are, what the achievements are. Um, and uh, I really hope that like people can mod this game and then make, put more tracks in or there'll be DLC or something. But it's very, very funny. And I do like the punk rockness of like, well, let's just take royalty free songs. Screw it. Let's let's <laughs> let's make it happen. <laughs> Amazing. Trombone Champ. Also, $14.99 on Steam. <laughs> I love these fucking weird ass games. It's so good. Um, fair play. Yeah. Collect all 50 tromboner cards today. <laughs> Um, Jeremy, let's talk about yours uh, before we swing back around to monkeys. Um, Road Warden. Yeah, Road have you Warden. guys heard of Road Warden? I have not. Okay, please, oh. Road Warden, is educate us. I love this awesome. const- I love this weekly. Jeremy has found this <laughs> gem. Okay, thing. it's like you're uh, like everyone who's going- listening. If if what I'm about to describe to you sounds appealing, go buy this game. It is ten dollars. Uh, okay. It's fucking awesome, and if if this sounds appealing to you, I feel like games like this need support. I am super enjoying it, so I I highly recommend it so far. But Road Warden is a uh, it is not a text based RPG, but it is kind of inspired by or adjacent to text based RPGs. What makes this different is that it has a uh, a piece of pixel art for every environment, and uh, so on your screen you're basically seeing kind of three panels. The leftmost panel is pixel art that shows the environment you're. In, whether that's a the inn or like a road or like a little abandoned village you're exploring pixel art of every environment which really you know like elevates the sense of immersion the the middle panel is text which is basically your main way of interacting with the world if you're talking to people making decisions about things fighting things um there's there's like dice rolls some of it is stat driven or class driven and then the rightmost panel is kind of like your inventory options uh and then like you can travel and stuff but basically it is a kind of um like semi open world RPG, uh, th- kind of like a, I don't know if it's like low or high fantasy. It's all very grounded, but there's like mythical creatures and stuff in the world. And I think the strength of this game 
is its world building. Like the world feels so fully baked and so fleshed out that uh, even though there is kind of like a core central plot to what you're doing, the, the kind of the, like my major motivating force in playing this game is that I, I kind of just want to see more of the world. Like I, I want to go around. I want to talk to people. Um, <clears throat> the game lets you make choices about things like uh, your relationship to the, the religion of this world, like where you stand on that stuff. You get to choose your class. And so uh, it gives you a good sense of role playing as the, as the character that you've decided upon. Um, so I've in playing like two, three hours of this game, I've only done combat one time and right. like not willingly. And then I like got the fuck out of there because my character is a scholar. Um, but then what being a scholar affords me is that I have a more, uh, like broad understanding of potions. Um, most people in this world are like illiterate and don't know anything about that. So it's kind of fun being like the guy who goes around and people are excited to see you cause you can like write a letter for them and stuff like that. Oh, wild. Um, and what this game does so brilliantly is it really, uh, like the, there were a few moments where I was like, oh, this game is, is way bigger than you think it is or it's incredibly efficient at the way it tricks you into thinking it's bigger than it seems at first glance because um this is early game but i also will be very vague so as to not spoil anything uh i found something on the road um and there was a text input box for the first time in this environment and it was like what do you you like walk into this place it described the whole place and it was like what do you want to like look for what do you want to interface with and so i started typing things couldn't find anything typed maybe like 10 or 15 things and nothing came up uh and then eventually found one that like led me down a path to keep typing in searches and eventually uncovered a thing. And the only reason my character could interface with it once I had found it was because I was a scholar. And that oh. led me down a whole thing of like finding a secret place with a secret thing. And the thing was like hinting that it might come in handy later to, but you felt like you uncovered it. Exactly. So because it was, yeah. it was that open text input. It wasn't like you couldn't go in and click on everything in this environment. You had to think through that, you know, because it's open text, you could just type in like, I, I search the room and it's like I you look around and it's like dusty but then you start typing in specifics you have to like build the room in your mind and start thinking about what kind of things you would do if you were actually there and once right. I started doing that it uncovered this thing that led me down a whole path um and then if I wasn't the scholar if I was the the mage or the warrior I totally would have missed out on that anyway even if I had found the thing um so yeah I don't know it's just uh it's it's really interesting I think it's like it's it's very immersive. I would put it kind of like in the citizen sleeper kind of genre of games. Right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm getting a sort of, a, um, I don't know, maybe it's the color palette, hmm. um, like a papers pleasey kind of uh, yeah. feel to how it at least looks. So I am really, um, I'm bad at text adventures. I've just never been interested in them because I'm so... Uh, you know, I can't read books very well either. I'm so visually minded. I read graphic novels a lot more than I read books. That's I listen to audiobooks actually easier than I can read books. Um, but because of the way that this does present an image of the area, like without, without being like specific to the room maybe, or that like it's showing like, but it's giving you something to grok onto. Like I, I, you know, sometimes when I read like hard sci-fi books or, or listen to them or whatever, I find it hard to really visualize the world you know, like what do trees and buildings look like in this place? Even that, just to like rest my hat, my hat on it. I, I'm actually really interested in playing this because like I really like how they show the world. Like they give you enough that you can then in your sort of the theater of the mind, you know, when you're doing the specific things, maybe that helps you f fill in some of that detail. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it, it also, they're very kind of clever about how efficiently they're using the, the visuals of these environments. There was one place where I went in and there was kind of a bunch of different, it was like an old abandoned town that had been sacked like a decade prior. And so I was kind of like searching the wreckage. Um, and the pixel art showed the outer gate. And, you know, as you're approaching, you don't know if it's dangerous. You don't know if there's like fucking goblins or whatever in there <laughs> right. and so as you're approaching the pixel art is just like maybe like the lower third of that uh of that panel was was visible and it was kind of like the outside like the palisades and the watchtowers or whatever but you can't see beyond there until you actually ah. go in and so it's it's not only clever because it like rewards you with a piece of art which is like a little you know serotonin drip when you're exploring but it's also um it, it makes places feel legitimately foreboding. Like the, the very start of the game is you walking up to a place and all you can see is the outer wall. And I, I immediately was like, are they going to like fuck me on the first, the first <laughs> choice I make is going to be like walking in and getting killed. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. And it, it, it's very, 
every environment you go to feels very dense with uh with like meaning the the people you talk to have a lot to say um they all have kind of different stances on the things that are going on in the world and uh oh yeah and kind of the the last big thing about this game that i think is really strong is the 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 core concept of the road warden uh the titular road warden is so you're a road warden and in this world in this game world um there's basically a core kingdom and then outside of that everything is just dangerous if you if you travel the roads there are bandits there are griffins there are wolves and dragons and just like <laughs> everything is trying to kill you and so almost nobody travels in fact you meet one guy and he like feeds you a really good meal if you play your cards right and then you're talking to him and he's basically like you get the sense that he is is like yeah i love to cook i love to drink i love this but that he's like he kind of hates being cooped up there. Like he, he's trying right. to tell, he's convincing himself how much he loves all of these comforts because he has an agoraphobic fear of leaving the, the safety of this inn where he lives. Um, and so it, yeah, I don't know. It plays into this, like the, the, the psychosocial dynamics of living in a world like this. And the road wardens are the only people who really travel basically, um, oh, that's or, cool. or at least travel solo. People travel in like groups and you know, whatever can fight off the goblins. But, um, but the road wardens travel and they like, uh, they go from town to town. They like facilitate, Take commerce. Uh, you're basically exploring a new area to try and see if it's like fit for the the kingdom to explore and like build trade into. And so you're you're going to this untamed peninsula, uh, and basically like people know of road wardens. There have been road wardens there before, but the whole place is just totally hostile and totally foreign and alien to you. So uh, it's it's really cool. I think the world building is the most effective thing in it, and it's kind of the thing that creates the volition for you to want to go around and explore. Is like just kind of you know it, it feels like you're actually exploring dude did you just use the word volition yeah i've never i've never even i didn't even know what that word meant what does, does it what does it mean like volition you're... like uh like volition is like um uh the the things you want to do basically like um, like your will or something yeah yeah exactly so uh okay. it's a it's a there's a really good gdc talk i'm blanking on who the fuck gave it uh but there's a very of your good... own volition of course yeah, of yes, your own volition yes, exactly. okay yes, yes um because you want to do it like you're it's what you will uh there's right. a very good gdc talk that i'll i'll have to look up and post in our discord but um about player volition about how how, mm. like good game design isn't giving players a thousand options that are all kind of like meh good game design is creating player volition where the player really wants to do something in a certain way and you give them like three very meaningful options like do you want right. to betray this person do you want to ally with them or do you want to like get the fuck out of there and not do anything um and so it's always better to give the player fewer more meaningful choices that they actually want to do uh, that there's strong player vo volition for rather than you know like you can pick up a coffee cup and you can put it down <laughs> so like saints row and red faction yeah, volition, exactly. volition. I, I get it now i know why they're called that yeah yeah um there you go. All right. War Road Warden on Steam. Yet another game that Jeremy has convinced me to, to purchase. It's only $10. It's only $10. That's a... Technically, actually, that's bad journalism. It's actually ten ninety nine. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. I got it on sale for like nine sixty eight or something. <laughs> sell some Steam trading cards and you'll make it. Yeah, exactly. Go, yeah, exactly. go sell some TF2 medic cards. And... Dude, I have those Apple AirPods oh. from TF2. Yeah, yeah. I, that, that, what? That, I used to get yeah. spam messages for like four years every day straight of people trying to trade <laughs> me. Me too. And eventually I was like, fine, screw you. And I, I sold them for like 38 bucks or something. I was just like, I'm, I'm done with this. I want this. Oh, it's like Jumanji. I don't want this curse anymore. I hate, it made me so angry at Team Fortress people. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much they're worth now. But the, the bots are gone again, so I think uh, so maybe... Uh, yeah. Maybe worth something. Uh, also worth mentioning, there is a demo of Road Warden available on Steam as well. So if you want to go check that out, first of all, uh, go right ahead. PC Gamer, Eurogamer, and Rock Paper Shotgun all have glowing uh, reviews of the game as well. So um, It's fantastic. Yeah, it's, I it highly like recommend it's pretty it. Good. it. Sounds like a, a hidden gem, this one. Road yeah. Warden. Check it out on Steam. Uh, not so much a hidden gem, but in our game that came to Steam, our fourth of the podcast is The Return of the first video game I ever played. Return to Monkey Island. Ron Gilbert's back at it again with the pirates. He's in charge. First time since Monkey Island 2. He was uh, joined by many of the uh, original <clears throat> Lucasfilm Games folks, uh, David Fox, uh, Dave Grossman uh, involved in this, and also Rex Crowell, who has been on this podcast. We interviewed him about knights and bikes back when we had the old Noclip studio. We had him in the podcast. Super nice British guy. Um, 
uh, great artist, and he is responsible for the art in this uh, in in this. What is this? Effectively, a sequel to Monkey Island Two, I would say. Um, but in many ways, sort of does speak to the wider themes of the games and things like that. Um, I am going to be as non-specific as humanly possible with this one because it is an adventure game and ultimately the story and what you do and who you meet and where you go and all that sort of jazz is uh, the the meat of the sandwich. Um, but uh, I do want to talk about it a little bit. So I guess what I'd ask is, do you guys have any? Do you guys have any questions about this game? Like lingering uh, w- wonders about it, or 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 things? You know, I'm not quite sure how into yeah. the Monkey Island stuff so either that, of you so are either. A, a, I, I've I've a good question is, as someone who never played the original Monkey Island, would I be able to enjoy this going in, or is it all like does it is it based upon having you played the original or being familiar with it? So the the boring technical answer is they have a little scrapbook that you start uh, that you can access from the menu at the start, and they actually encourage you to kind of highlight it when you load in. Um, that basically has like, oh, here's what happened to Monkey Island one, and then you can click on oh, okay. pages in the scrap, and it'll actually give you more specific information too, which is pretty cool. So you can go pretty deep if you want to. Um, the real answer is I don't know if all of the stuff will land as well. Because this is very much a game about how time has passed and how fandoms react to stories. And it is very, like, it is very beat by beat similar to the original Monkey Island in a, in a smart, I feel like something has happened in the past five years where, and and the soft reboot may be partly responsible for this, but where creators in both games and film I have seen have done a really great job of acknowledging the like meaning and history of a franchise's past without being dragged underwater by it. And I think Monkey Island is a franchise where those first two games were unbelievably terrific just two of the best funniest most interesting worlds open world games ever made like there's a reason why people are so infatuated with them the 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 universe they painted was so magical and wondrous and fun and you know just it was they're almost perfect and in the sequels while they were sort of good games in their own right they did not capture that feel much at all they drifted far away and that's kind of i think where a lot of franchises go and i don't know why i feel like in film and in we've creators and people have gotten better at making games that are very evocative of the original game somehow they tapped into that thing without being you know derivative or whatever so i don't know if you've never played a monkey island game how fun this is if you have played a monkey island game this this is this is a sucker punch. I have, I laughed and I cried. It, it it was like, it was way better than I thought it would be, quite frankly. And the ending, which is almost impossible to, to how do you end a game like this? How do you, it's, and the thing, a hero is now crying at me again. It's like second podcast in a row. He's like, he's like, I know, Monkey Island, I love it. <laughs> I think, I think, I think they fucking swung for the fences on the ending. And I, I bet that they're a bit nervous about what people will think of it, but I think it was fucking brilliant. I think the ending is a masterstroke in this game. I think the whole the whole thing really works. So I don't know. So it's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell, Frank, whether or not this is something you'd be like into if you'd never played any yeah. of them, you know? Uh, another question I have is like, how have they modernized like playing an adventure game or is it still like, what is it verb specific is it easier because original lucas arts games are so hard <laughs> yeah the, the the yeah the the whole um scum uh system or whatever uh yeah so the, so this is like a master class in how to make adventure games for modern uh, gamers because they have there's a couple of things they have first of all the verbs and stuff that you have at the bottom of the screen that's all gone um the uh, inventory is not on the screen anymore. It's like it's hidden in a, you know, you click on a bag on the screen. Um, and then basically just like when you're clicking on stuff, it doesn't even say like open door. Da, da, da. It'll say like go in oh. or it'll say like 
they've actually made jokes out of the system where it's like remark on such and such or like they're, 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 I can't remember any off the top of my head now, but like some of the things you click on will be like, oh, that's very funny. Like ignore ignore Wally or something like, you know, like it makes jokes <laughs> at it and which is pretty good. So it just streamlines all that stuff because I think in the original games, uh, there was a big thing about, yeah, player choice and being able to like really think out puzzles that way, which I think modern games wouldn't be able to do. The other thing they've done, and they've toyed with this in the past, they had a tip system in the... I forget what they were called, remasters or whatever. They did, you know, five or six years or six or seven years ago. They had a sort of a rudimentary tip system, which would give you, I think, you would you would ask and it would give you like a sort of a hint. And then the next time it would kind of tell you what to do with, with a certain puzzle. But it was kind of a little bit inelegant and all that sort of stuff. There are two things that they have. There are objects in your inventory. One is Guybrich's to-do list, which is literally a... Like, Frank, you know the way, like, you like to have your your diaries where you, like, have, yeah. here are the things I'm doing today, and then you indent ones that are connected to that? It is that, which means that you always know what you're meant to be doing or what you haven't done yet, which is a great, uh, a big problem with these games, uh, or can be. And the other is the hint system. Uh, like, I think everything in this probably has, I don't know, from my experience, a minimum of six layers of hint, and sometimes more, where they'll go, like... Um, you're like, how am I supposed to get this object from this person? Like, have you tried this? Have you did this? There's something in your inventory that can help. <laughs> Take this thing from your inventory and maybe ask some people about it. And then eventually it'll be like, yo, just take the cop and give it to such and such. You know what I mean? But it, but it's so good. It, and it doesn't... The problem with the hint system in the past is it really made you feel like you were cheating or looking up an FAQ. But because of the sort of light touch and you can kind of go, uh, give it, you know, it, each time it gives you enough where you still feel like you figured it out. You know, you got a hint, but you still, you know, maybe you needed a little bit more of a nudge and you're like, oh, that's what, oh, now I know what I meant to do, of course. And it meant that like I, I completed it in nine hours and I never get, st- I, I never got stuck unless I was happy being stuck. And I think that was really important. There were some puzzles that I was like, no, I'm going to figure this out by myself because I feel like I almost have it. And I've already figured out everything else in this one part and I want to really do it. And then there were other parts where it was kind of like, oh, I really want to know what happens next. Or near the end, there was a couple of puzzles that were, you know, quite close to the end of the game. And I was like, that's ah, fine. Like, I, I know what they're trying to do here, but, you know, I'll just I'll just skip through it a little bit and get a little hints. And yeah, just made that whole part of the, the big asterisk that floats over all these games of like just kind of how you have to suffer through some of those mechanics to enjoy the writing and the world building. It totally fixed it. Like it's 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 a perfect system, I think, for, for getting through those. I really thought it was great. That's really clever because I think that's the kind of the biggest uh, design problem with games that are about like giving the player a huge amount of open choice and ways to interact with the world in complex ways Uh, and and don't give them a system to kind of just like brute force it where there's like three slots and three options and you just eventually give up and smash them all in there. Um, it, It reminds me of like, uh, when someone's asking you to guess something in real life, and then you're like, "Give me, a, give me a hint, but don't, don't make it obvious," you know. Like, I still want to have the 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 thrill of the conquest of getting it right. I don't <laughs> want it to be obvious. Exactly, but it's but also if you've nothing to aim for and you're swimming in ignorance, that's not fun either. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah you got to give the player something to hold on to at some point. But also, it, it's cool that you can opt into that because um, it, it, both extremes are kind of equally dis, dissatisfying where it's like, if it, if it's too easy, the game is just like constantly pointing you in the right direction. You're like, just ease off and let me figure something out on my own. <laughs> but then uh, the total other extreme, if they never give you anything, then you, you, you know, I've, I've given up on games because I just didn't want to keep looking things up for them. yeah. Exactly. Um, the art style, I think, as well, if people got put off by it, I think I can understand why people might be put off because I think in trailers it flashes between a lot of these, like it's very detailed looking. But when you're playing it, it's actually like it's 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 the perfect for me. Like it's a very good level of detail played on a big screen. You're going to be looking at these same places a lot and spending a lot of time you know what i mean like it's not like your average game where you're moving through environments like it's a game where you're looking at the same backdrop sometimes for like minutes on end in a row you know what i mean or like seconds on so the detail works i think better when you're playing it than maybe it comes across in the in the in the it can seem like a doing too much maybe in the trailers so i think that's also 
uh, worth pointing out. Um, yeah, and it's just, it's a very, I don't want to get into any of it, but it is a very, it is the type, it had a, it had like a sort of a feeling that you can't make up you have to have had 30 years between it like and it hit it hit me like right in the heart like and it knew exactly what it was like i i really think and i followed ron gilbert's work a lot over the years i enjoyed the cave and a lot of other stuff that he's worked on in the past timbleweed park like i i followed his career as i followed so many of the the folks who worked um uh, you know, on a on on those Lucas games early in those days, and Ron has always like his name on Twitter is Grumpy Gamer, right? He has <laughs> always had the sort of um, I don't know, like the, the I, he he presents himself, and I interviewed him in the past at Gamespot, I believe, for Timbleweed, maybe. Um, he presents himself as as a as a guy who made this inc- these incredible works, and obviously not just Monkey Island, in the past, and has never found the the right team again, has never been able to like, you know, he's an he's expert at what he does, but he just didn't really have the sort of the, the perfect folks around him to make the next thing. And I'm not saying that everyone else was to blame or whatever. Maybe also he was a parts in his career where, he, but it never really landed like some of the early stuff really landed. And this fucking lands, like, like as good. Like, this is the third best Monkey Island game, and maybe the second best. Like, I, I, I think this is so good. And to see somebody who has, like, it is very clear when you're playing this game that it is made by somebody, and not just him, but also, like, Dave Fox and Dave Grossman, um, and and Dominic Armada, who's, who does the voice in this, who voiced Guybrush from from you know three, I think onward, um, that he had been weighed down by this fucking franchise his entire career. That as much as it like set him up, it also has been like a, a noose around his neck in some way. And that's like that's in the game. Like that comes across in the game, implied and explicit. It's there and. It's like, it's just fucking amazing. It's amazing to see with all the expectations on a game like this. And in many ways, maybe the muted expectation because we, I think Monkey Island fans have been disappointed by new, new Monkey Island games a lot in the past. To see how this ended up and especially the ending, which I think it struggles with the almost impossible task of how do you create a meaningful ending to this game, which is trying to sum up all of this. And for them to have done it in such an elegant and really bold and brave and not obvious way, I think it's just like it's like it's like the it's like the underdog scoring a goal in the ninety fifth minute. Even if you don't support them, you just want to fucking stand up and scream. I was so happy for him and the team and for Monkey Island fans. I just felt like, oh, this is this is like a fucking triumph. We don't get this very often in like games and not to like oversell this game i don't think it's like i don't necessarily think that it is like game of the year or anything like that but it means a lot to me and with the specific i guess baggage and task that this game had to achieve it nails that it i I can't see how it could have done it better it's 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 super perfect length super funny like laugh out loud funny all the time or throughout it i love the characters returning and new lots of very funny jokes about the past and the future and fan service and how things have moved on and now all the pirates like dark magic and they don't care about your old pirate stuff it's fucking great um yeah i did but the one thing i don't know is if you'll be into it if you've never played a monkey island game but um yeah if i go if i like what what is the shortest route to enjoy this maybe play the first one read about the other ones and then play this one or it's yeah it's hard to tell because like i think i i don't know maybe it's just play this one i don't know the first game is hard to recommend to people unless you're like you're probably going to need to open a fact for some of this because it's like 
because even it's probably harder now because at least back then you knew how silly these games were but like maybe it's more difficult now only I for would true scumbags it. now <laughs> exactly here you see that, here's the thing you're into i think this might actually be a long did you play any adventure games growing up oh like, a ton i played like um were you a sierra guy i played like Putt Putt and Freddy the Fish and that kind of stuff because I was a child. But uh, yeah, I I definitely played. Um, God, I can't even remember. I can like picture art from them, but I can't remember names. So I'll have to look them up. Like Indiana Jones. Yeah. Or, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, I would give the secret of Monkey Island like an evening. Okay. And if it has grabbed you, and you're like, oh, this is this is, and 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 I would play the original. Well, maybe play the. Play the re-release so it runs, but play it in the old graphics. Okay. Like, with the old music. Don't, the new graphics are fine, but, like, I think the new graphics now look more dated than the old graphics looked when that came out. Um, so play the original-looking, like, DOS-looking shit or whatever. All right. I'm going to eat a giant edible and play Monkey Island 1. <laughs> yeah. It's like, oh, dude. It's I, And if it grabs you, it'll get you. And and if it doesn't, the, the color palette and the music and the, the, the world, it's... And if it doesn't, then, you know, maybe just play this and and go through the scrapbook at the start. It's pretty good. Cool. Yeah. I'm intrigued. Return. You got, you got, you've risen my interest. Man, I just want to do a spoiler cast on that as well, but it's hard without like, you know, I'll have to grab somebody who's like a, I had a couple of people in my DMs, um, <laughs> game developers and other people who were like, you've played it too. Because obviously I, a couple of, you know, not that many people got code before it came out um, and we were all just gushing about it. So, um yeah, people seem to like it, which is pretty cool. Return to Monkey Island, available on uh, quite a lot, I think. It's on, uh, no, it's PC and Switch, is it? Yeah, Mac OS as well, apparently. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's on Windows. Uh, it's on Steam Deck as well. I played a bit of it. And it's on Nintendo Switch. Uh, it costs how much on Steam? Do, 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 do. It's gotten good reviews as well. I got nines on IGN and GameSpot, which is pretty cool. Nice. And uh, it is twenty four ninety nine. Uh, there you go. Pick it up now. Beautiful. All right, that's a podcast, gentlemen. Um, we had a, a, a nice full podcast this week. We'll get Jesse back next week. I'm excited for that. I think that's a patron only podcast. The fucking hero wants to be on the podcast. Clearly, I gotta go rub his belly again. Um, we also do have a interview, um, which I recorded earlier uh, this week with Jay Armstrong, who is one of the folks over at Massive Monsters, the development team behind Cult of the Lamb. So I had a chat with him about Cult of the Lamb and the history of the studio. Um, they're another one of these Flash game people, man. They're just like, they're everywhere. These Flash game devs who who end up making something cool in the indie space. Uh, so we'll have that. That'll be like a bonus podcast. I'll put it up sometime. Um, maybe it's up already, actually. I'm not, I'm not sure. We'll see. Um, maybe I'll put it up over the weekend. Um, uh, and yeah, that'll be just an extra bonus podcast in your feed. It's about 30 minutes long. It was a good chat. Uh, so you can enjoy that too. Uh, thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Uh, if you'd like to support us and all that shenanigans, head over to patreon.com slash noclip. We're at noclip video on most of the social things. I'm at Danny O'Dwyer. He's at Frank Howley. He's at Jeremy B. Jane. Uh, go check out Noclip Crew. We got some more videos coming up. We'll have a little tour of the, uh, of the studio uh, in the next week or so as well, which should be pretty cool. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening to the pod. Jeremy, what's the rest of your uh, week look like? The rest of your day? Uh, I am deep in the weeds on editing the Tomb Raider documentary. Nice. Uh, Love it. And uh, I'm allowed to say that, right? We've, with this, you are. You are. Okay. Allowed to say that. <laughs> well, I always lose track, and then I'm like, oh, fuck, you're going to have to edit that out. Um, yeah, it's 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 really cool. Um, I think I've found a very clever way of uh, of of tying in the old titles and stuff. And uh, without getting into any of the interview content, I've been pulling old Tomb Raider commercials from the nineties. Oh, um, nice! And the best one in the world is it's this. Uh, it's like super. 90s camera style everything's always snap zooming and everyone looks like manic and the whites of their eyes are visible uh this dad <laughs> shakes his son awake in bed and he tells him they're going to get tomb raider and then it cuts to them in the kitchen and he's like pouring his 10 year old son a cup of coffee in a tweety bird mug or whatever <laughs> uh and he's like but but dad we don't have a playstation and it cuts to the dad and does a snap suit on, on him and he goes you do now and they go to you know like the toys r us or whatever to get it and laura croft is there signing autographs 
Um, like, like 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 3D Lara is Croft? A, a low poly 3D Lara Croft wow. is there signing autographs and she like lowers her sunglasses and looks at the dad and he's clearly smitten and he gets like a picture with her, gets the Polaroid, the whole thing. Uh, and then the closing <laughs> shot is my favorite moment in the commercial. Uh, the son is looking at the dad who is clearly, you know, starstruck and in love. Uh, and he says, uh, I don't think mom's going to like this. And the dad goes, who? Um, oh my god! It, it's like just destroying homes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I uh, it's it's pretty great. So I'm definitely trying to. Uh, there's there's part of the interview where someone talks about their dad bringing home a PlayStation, and I'm trying to do a smash cut to oh that's the, brilliant. the dad, and then he says, "You do now." <laughs> So that uh, is going to be the rest of my week. Also, I've been learning to draw. Drawing is fucking fun. Everyone should just go draw stuff. It's cool. Nice. Yeah. I draw a lot with my daughter, but I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, I don't get to draw all the satanic stuff. I'd love to draw. If, like, if she didn't, this is, if this she was a, chill. This is an audio visual medium. I drew the uh, the scarecrow from Howl's Moving Castle. Whoa. Oh, look at that! Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah. Hey, everyone, imagine a drawn picture of the scarecrow from Howl's Moving, Ca- Moving Castle. There you go. Uh, dude, I have so much B roll for for the Tomb Raider stuff as well. We got like greatest hits mm. copy of Tomb Raider two here. Nice. I got the Prima official. Dude, the books you can get on just Amazon, like just old video game books and strategy guides. It's like a secret weapon. I got the official strategy guide for. All of Tomb Raider? I think the first three. Nice. Look at that. I was going to interview with Angelina Jolie. <laughs> that rules. Awesome. You know, the Tomb Raider. And there's also a strategy guide commercial for Fear Effect in the back as well. So there you nice. Go. Um, yeah, Frank, what do you got? What are you all doing for the rest of your day? Um, let's see. Uh, chilling. Well, today, big comic book day. There's so many new comics, so I'm going to read. Um, my my backlog games have been Lost Judgment and Cyberpunk. The new update they've oh, yeah. updated a bunch over the last year, but it, it, it's like a good chill out game. And then my Steam Deck comes Friday. Oh, I'm so excited! Oh, terrific! Oh, nice. So excited. There's there's been a specific backlog of like I'm almost calling like visual novel like JRPG type games that I've been wanting to play like Disco Elysium, Persona 4, like just games where I just don't want to sit at the computer and read. So I'm excited to spend some time on the couch this weekend with my Steam Deck. Excellent. Congratulations. What a good time. Um, all right. That's the podcast for another week. Thank you so much. Uh, head up over to patreon.com if you want to get access to next week's Patreon only podcast. And if not, we'll see you on the other side. Take care. Play some video games. Bye. Bye.